Hello and good morning. Welcome to Dallas Church. So glad that you're here. Uh, we are finishing up our series in Revelation today. We're going to be hearing from Pastor Andrew. Uh, we're going to also be singing some songs, listening to the message, uh, all to create an environment so you can experience fellowship with God and with each other. So let's pray as we get started. Most kind Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful to be gathered together to lift up your name, to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for fellowship. We thank you for the unity in this church, Lord. We thank you for your spirit. Uh, just be with Andrew as he gives the message today that hearts and minds would be open and that lives would be changed and, and that someone would take that next step closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. is rising eyes are turning to you we turn to you hope is stirring eyes are yearning for you we long for you is when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Sunday, the crowds cheered 
Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But they didn't know that it came to be a ransom for many. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name above all names blessed Messiah, oh, Lord, Lord, His body, the bread, His body, the bread, His blood, the wine, broken and poured, all for love. The hall had trembled and the veil was torn. So amazing, thank you, Lord. Love so amazing. See now, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed.
And at the end of the Disney movie, there is a wedding. They ride off into the sunset. And the wedding is the day where after that day, all things are different. On, on my wedding day, um, there was this kind of cute little thing that happened uh, to us. See, my wife and I, we had the ceremony. And then we rode off, supposedly into the sunset. But if you're you know, dressed up like that, you got to stop off for a photo shoot first, right? That's got to do that. So the photographer met us at this park that was like half a mile away from the church where we got married. And we go to the park, and we're like looking for the tree, trying to find the really cute. Do you see that? Do you see how beautiful baby Andrew, Joe were? This is great. Yeah. This is re really, I was just looking for an excuse to share family photos with you. That's what I wanted. Uh, no, so we're at the park, and there are these group of probably four or five-year-old little girls that are on the other end of the park. And they're playing around on the play structure, having a good time, and then they clocked us. <laughs> and I heard the squeals. And I heard the sounds as they oohed and awed. And they came up, and they were like, ooh, look, a wedding. And it was like one of the cutest experiences of my life, because we're walking around like getting these photo shoots done, and our fan club just <laughs> fell in line behind us. And, and they, had, they saw my wife's dress. I don't know, like, they probably, if they had gotten the chance, like, they would have put their grubby little paws all over it to try and find this. This is a beautiful, this is wedding. And there's something primal about that. There is something really important and significant about weddings. And, and especially the way that things were done in ancient worlds or past cultures, like, the wedding was this huge day. It was this day, and after that day, all things were different. Um, and actually, my wedding felt a little bit like that. And I know, like, this is as mushy as I'm going to get, guys, OK? This is the story of Andrew's wedding. No, but, but the way that my love story worked out is that uh, Joe and I grew up in Eugene Springfield. Um, we had a lot of the same friends, but did not meet each other until after high school. And by that, I know that God is good. Because if she had met middle school Andrew, she would not have been interested. But God was like, nope, we're just, we're just going to keep you guys apart for a healthy amount of time. And so then we got together, and we dated. We were in the same uh, kind of geographical area for one year. And then I got called away to go do Bible college in Boise, Idaho, of all places, um, which I wasn't super thrilled about. But when Jesus says, go, you leave your girlfriend 700 miles behind. And, uh, and so I went. And when I went to this school, like there was this kind of four-year growth period of undergrad where I did internships, and I worked jobs, and I went to class, and I learned how to shower every day. Or you know, just like I grew up. And what was funny was it was like in our friend group. So I built this little community, and we all found each other. We were friends looking out for each other growing up. And some of them met, got engaged, and got married within the span of like just my engagement. Because it was like this overarching thing, like the constant. Because they met me, and they're like, this is Andrew. He has a girlfriend back in Oregon that we've never seen, but he says that she exists. And then they, then they saw her. They met her. So our wedding um, happened a month after all of our friend group graduated. And it was kind of this like reunion. Like We all grew up. We all started building our lives. And this was the capstone. This was the final event. Like, this was the final episode of Friends or How I Met Your Mother or whatever, like the sitcom that is my life. This was this moment. And our rehearsal dinner was super, super beautiful and fun. And like, my, my siblings and I had built a dance floor in our backyard. And the rehearsal dinner that my parents threw, like we could have just, like the preacher was sitting right there. We could have just hauled him over and been like, do you, do you, I do, I do, like we're done, we're good. Because everyone was there. It was this huge celebration. And, and it was this day, it was the beginning of a new reality. And for me, after that day, all the days were different. 
And it had come after a season of struggle. For six months leading up to the wedding, I was living on two to three hundred dollars a month, eating rice and beans, just like Dave Ramsey told me to. Like, I was, I was saving up for the honeymoon. I was preparing. My wife was, was working through her massive to-do list of things, and I'm so glad that she decided to still marry me at the end of that to-do list, because she was like picking out all the decorations and the dress and the flowers. And maybe for you, maybe your wedding was different, maybe you haven't had a wedding, but many of us, we've experienced days where after that day, things were different. The end of a training program, after we meet that special someone, maybe you try to get pregnant for a really long time, you finally have the baby, now there's a day where after that day, all things are different, right? But there are these days, and in the story of the Bible, the framework that we have is the idea of a wedding feast as the day after which all things are different. And this is at the very end of the book of Revelation, which we made it. We're here. Good job. Give yourself a pat on the back if you want to. Yeah, well done. I know. I know for some of you, when we said, guess what, Dallas Church, we're going to do seven weeks through the book of Revelation, like your heart just sunk. And you were like, last time they just did the minor prophets, a global pandemic hit. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen if we do Revelation. Or maybe like you're like me and you grew up and you're like, Revelation is a scary book full of really scary, weird things. And I don't know what to do with it. So I have no desire to touch it. And as you have learned over the last seven weeks, it is in fact a book full of really weird, scary things. But maybe you have found some familiar questions in the midst of the weird images. Maybe you have found some help or some application because the lens that we've been looking at, which I think is from what I can see, the helpful lens that I can glean what I need from this is to look at Revelation as a guide to churches that need to be faithful in a culture that is pulling them away from walking close to God. Because that's where we find some of those familiar questions. Let's pray and see what God would say to us through this last section. Father God, we open our hearts and we ask you to speak to us. We ask you to do what you would, do what you want through our lives. Help us to be submitted to your will and to take steps of obedience as we follow you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we have made it all the way through the crazy images of Babylon and the beast and the dragon and the scary bad guys that are coming against God's people. We've looked at some really practical advice for churches to stay faithful. And at the end of it all, if you got your Bibles, Revelation 19, verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory because the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. And this is the framework that the, at the end of all things, there is this day And it's talked about in Revelation. It's talked about through the prophets. There is the day of the Lord. And it is the day where after that day, all things are different. And one of the ways that Jesus likes to describe himself is he calls himself the bridegroom, which is a really weird thing for a celibate Nazarene preacher walking around talking about himself. But it's because there's this language throughout the whole story of the Bible that following God is a little bit like a marriage. And the lamb does have a bride. And that bride is the church. It's God's people. And dudes, before we feel called to sing the Jesus is my boyfriend songs, um, it's that we are the bride of Christ. Like communally, as a church, we are the bride of Christ together. So am I the bride of Christ? That, That could lead us to some complicated identity grounds, okay? But the bride of Christ 
is adorned and prepared because there has been this long engagement period of time. There's work of preparation that is leading up to it. And just like I was in Boise, Idaho, working and preparing to get a wedding to happen, my wife was in Oregon working and preparing for a wedding that would happen. We are on this planet, in this world, with a purpose. And as the bride of Christ, the church is working and preparing, except we don't go to the fancy dress store or however that works. I wasn't present for that part of the preparation, but we are adorned through the righteous acts, through the good things, through the mission of God, the way we show up in small ways. And we're leaning forwards into that day. And before you get to the wedding, though, you have to get through the battle. Skip down to verse 11. And then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse, and its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. And he had a name written on it that no one knows except himself. And he wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, we've encountered some mysterious figures in Revelation, but this one's not mysterious because we've already got the code. Like, we've already seen it. Right in chapter 1, like, John sits and sees the Colossus Jesus enthroned, on this massive throne and he's got fiery eyes. He is the one who is faithful and true. And when John writes to a church and is like, you guys need to be faithful and true to God, he points them towards the one, Jesus, who is faithful and true. And he's riding on a white horse into battle. Now we've already talked about today's Palm Sunday. And there's a specific event we celebrate like the Sunday before Easter where Jesus rode into Jerusalem but he didn't ride with the tanks or the jet fighters or even on the white horse. He rode on the beast of burden. He rode on the donkey. You do not ride a donkey into battle. You lose if you do that, okay? I'm sure there's literature out there somewhere, but that's a bad plan. But this time, he's riding on the horse and he's coming to defeat evil. The armies that were in heaven followed him on the white horse, wearing pure white linen, and a sharp sword came out of his mouth that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod, and he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is that climax moment. This is the moment we've been waiting for. The saints were around the throne of God and they were asking God, how long? How long are you gonna let evil do what evil does? How long are you gonna let darkness, Babylon, monsters have their way in this world? Maybe you have asked that question too. Maybe you have read a headline that made you mad. Ever read a headline in the news before? Made you mad? A lot of them make God mad too. And before you like point the finger and you're like, see, Dallas Church, I grew up in Sunday school. I heard the preachers. I know you guys have been trying to tell me for the longest time that God isn't like that angry guy that sits on the cloud with the lightning bolt that's just looking for people having fun to throw the lightning bolt and zap them. And you're like, I know. You've said like God is a God of forgiveness and a God of grace, but ha ha, I gotcha. You guys are just trying to make it fuzzy and fluffy and follow Jesus, love your neighbor. Well, hang on. Because there are things in this world that we want God to be angry at. And if he wasn't, he actually would stop being good. And the forgiveness of God never looks at sin and darkness and brokenness and say, well, you know, it's just okay. We're all going to get along. But rather he says, I'm going to deal with it in the harshest terms and that Jesus dies on a cross, not so that we can look at sin and say, well, it's okay, but so that God says, no, we're okay. You are forgiven. You can come to me. And it's almost like all the, all the evil and darkness and the things that we look at in the world and we don't like them, there is a framework in the Bible that it's like God's judgment is behind this floodgate. 
it's stored up. It's waiting. It's not like he's not going to do anything about it. But it's that he's waiting for the right time. And when it does open up, he deals with evil and puts an end to it. And by that, he shows himself to be the hero that the whole story of the Bible was already leaning, leading up to. In there, it says that Jesus will rule with an iron rod. That is from Psalm chapter 2. The framework that the book of Psalms gives us about what does it mean to be a human that follows God? Well, we meditate on his word, chapter 1, and we trust in the person who is the word, chapter 2, that there is a Messiah, there is this king who is coming. And then the language of the prophets is that the judgment of God is this wine press. And so what, G what John is doing is he's actually weaving together these details to paint a picture that is really powerful. Allow me to tell you about a picture that was really powerful for me. Um, we're going solidly into Andrew Nerd territory, so if you need to buckle up, go for it, okay? Um, the opening day of Avengers Endgame. <laughs> 10 years of Marvel cinematic storytelling. And many of you, some of, the, some of you, you watched all the movies. Some of you, you didn't watch all the movies. That's okay, I did. I can tell you all about them. <laughs> but there's a moment, okay, at the end, like this is where all of these story threads that they had dropped, they come to their culmination. And there's this really cool moment where like the line that Captain America is supposed to say from the comics over and over again, he's supposed to say, Avengers, assemble. Which I know sounds lame for me on a stage, but it's really cool when it's Chris Evans on a multi-million dollar movie, okay? So... Captain America, he gets the hammer of Thor, and like it's this moment when his back is against the wall, and it looks like he's going to lose, and we don't know if we're going to make it. And I'm sitting there in the theater watching this. And then like the Thor hammer comes flying towards Captain America. He catches it, and the whole audience went nuts because I was surrounded by like hundreds of very cool people like me. And we all sat there. We were like, yes, I knew it. He did it. That's what this moment's supposed to be. Can you imagine being a first century reader and maybe, like, maybe somebody from your small group isn't there anymore because Rome killed them? And you got questions and you're like, I, are, we, are we still doing this thing? Are we still being faithful? Because this doesn't look like we're winning. I don't know that I like this picture right now of where God is leading my life. And they get this document and they read it through from the written word, which at that time is like the most cool digital cutting edge of technology that you could get. And they're reading it off and they talk about this moment where Jesus shows up and like a wine press, like in a rod of iron, like he does it. He wins. And I know that you guys aren't going to erupt because my preaching's not quite there yet. Someday, right? Someday. We'll be like, yeah, Jesus. He did it! Woohoo! Yeah, there you go. See, there are a couple people first service want to do that too. Yeah. No, and the beast, so, so the, the wedding comes at the end of this battle where it is hot, fought hard for. Verse 19, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider and against the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner along with the false prophet. And he deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image with its signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Jesus won. He did it. The bad guys lose. And then the next chapter, in chapter 20, there is the power behind it all. And it's almost like we start seeing a lot of pictures from Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that are popping up again here at the very end of Revelation because in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, there was a bad guy and he was a snake. He was a serpent. And so then Jesus deals with Satan, that ancient serpent. And, and there's a description here of something that lots of scholars talk about called the millennial kingdom because Satan is like bound and he's taken and put away and then Jesus reigns, but then he comes back and then he's doing some evil bad stuff again and then Jesus finally defeats him and throws him in the lake of fire at the end. And this 
passage here becomes the lightning rod for so many views of Revelation. And we will not have a lecture on that today. You're welcome. Right? But, but I don't want to ask the question about what and how. And like, okay, what's the timeline? What date? Which election cycle will Jesus finally show up in? Like, I don't, I don't know. But the question I want to deal with is why and who? Why does God deal with Satan? Because there has been this enemy. And he's been at work ever since. Genesis chapter 3. God made a good world. He put Adam and Eve in a garden. He was going to walk with them. He was going to be close to them. But darkness has crept in. And God fixes that. He deals with it. Like the whole experiment of creation, this whole arc of reality is God making what was broken whole. Is God dealing with darkness? And even when we want to ask the same question that the martyrs asked on the throne where they said, how long, God? We can trust that God's going to deal with it. And I think back to so often Uh, God's people are told the way that we do battle, the way that we handle it is by letting God handle it. He says, vengeance is mine. And that's why we don't take up arms to defeat evil because we don't have the bullet that can get Satan, right? Like we can't do that. That's for Jesus. And so if there are like, evils and dark forces and systems and things in your life, and you're like, I don't have the power to deal with it. Welcome to the club. This is where God's people have always been. We're going to let God show up. We're going to let him deal with it because we know that the God who made creation good can do it again. In chapter 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, when have we seen heavens and earth? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And and our image of the kingdom of God needs to be shaped by the biblical story and not by Renaissance paintings and not by Looney Tunes. Like there is not a vision of heaven where everybody's getting diapers and harps distributed to them with their cherub wings. Like... That's not what's going on here. And on the converse side, like there isn't like a party that Satan rules over, which is an image that is also present. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the God who created the world in the first place recreates it and makes it good. There was one day when one kid from youth group was gone and I was preaching about this and just doing a teaching, and I was like, so here's the deal. I don't actually want to go to heaven when I die. And I know, like, I see the ha, I heard that. I heard that, and this kid was gone, and and of course, you know, don't tweet me out of context, but what I was saying is, like, I want to go to new heaven, new earth. Like, whatever it is that God is creating, that's where I want to be. And it was so fun that this girl was so confused next week when she came back, And I'm like, what I teach about last week? And they're all like, how you don't want to go to heaven? And she's like, what? Wait, wait. I thought the youth pastor of anybody should want to go to heaven. But it's this new creation. It's different. And maybe we let the imagery of the Bible do some work on us to reprogram and deprogram some of the stories that we've been given. He says, I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Which I know that the Bible can be a difficult book to get through. I know that there are some moments where we're like, God, what's the story? What are you doing here? But over and over again, there's this common theme where he keeps the main thing, the main thing. That he wants to be with people. He wants to be God. He wants to be our God. He wants us to be his people. And that's a pretty deep that's a pretty deep idea if we, if we sit with that for a second. 
Because many of us walk around this world feeling unwanted. And we are wanted. God wants us. He wants to be close to us. He wants to be with us. And that was the picture back, Genesis 1 and 2. Humans walking with God in a garden. No evil. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. And here's what I know about all of us. Your life has been touched by grief, death, crying, and pain. I know that because your feet are on planet Earth. And that's what it feels like to be here. We, we live in the world that is not this new Jerusalem. And we look forward to a day where God shows up and he wipes every tear. And that's not, I think, to invalidate our negative experiences from this life. I've got a three-year-old daughter at home. There's a lot of skinned knees. There's a lot of tears. There's a lot of wiping away of tears that needs to be done. And to say, baby girl, I know that hurt. And I invite you to get back on the swing set because you've got a good future ahead of you. And I wonder if that's what God does here. Father God wipes the tears away. And maybe that gives us some framework for the things we experience. Not to invalidate what we're going through because it's hard. The hard things you're up against, like some of them, the hardest things you've ever gone through. Well, they're the hardest things you've ever gone through. And God sees them. And he calls you into something beautiful and beyond that. Because our good creator has good things in store for us. And in this city, there's a lot of different like word pictures. And once again, let's, let's try to get at what are these pictures teaching us about who God is. There is, at the climax of this story, New Jerusalem has 12 tribes and 12 apostles. It is the Old Testament story, the New Testament story working together in one story of humanity, of God reconciling us to himself. And then we find out that New Jerusalem is 12,000 stadia cubed. And nobody's jaw hits the floor. That's okay, I don't know how much 12,000 stadia is unless I read the chart at the back of the Bible that is charts and maps. That's 1,400 miles. That's a huge city. That's all the way from here to Phoenix, Arizona. That's like two days of driving. One day if you're insane and three if you're having a good time, okay? That's, that's a long ways. This city's huge. And why is it that big? Well, maybe it is because it is that big. Like maybe that's why he writes it that way. Or maybe he's taking some paradigms and flipping them on their head. You think Rome is a big city? Oh, you gotta think bigger. You think Dallas, Oregon is a big city? Nobody thinks that, right? No, but we gotta think bigger. The, this church, this church is a cool place, right? We got, we're making it cool. We got balloons everywhere. We got lights. You think this is cool? Think bigger. This is what he's saying. Think bigger. And this thing is cubed. And I'm sure that's exactly what you're asking is, Andrew, what's the theological significance of it being cubed? I'm so glad you asked. That's the next point on my outline. It's cubed because there was one thing that was a cube in the ancient temple. The Holy of Holies. The place where only like the, the presence of God actually like physically touched earth in a way that was mysterious and there was like a cloud and all kinds of cool stuff going on. And in the temple, like, so the Gentiles, people that weren't Jewish, they had to stay in one quarter. Women had to go in another one. Regular Israelite men could go in here. 
priest could go a little closer, and then the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence was like the most active. And we had to tie a rope to his foot in case he wasn't actually holy when he walked in and like just something metaphysical, physical happened and he dropped dead. This is crazy. How about we not build one of those in Dallas church? That's a good idea, right? But, but his idea, what he does, so why is the city cubed? Because the whole city is that holy of holies. God like democratizes the access to him. Everybody's welcomed in. And what's in the city right down the center of Main Street is the tree of life. It's been a lot of pages since we mentioned the tree of life. Genesis 1 and 2. God puts man and woman in the garden with the tree of life. And when they sin, when evil enters the world, they are disconnected from that life. And in this new city, they are once again given access. They are brought back to the source of life. And just like a wedding, this is the day where the adventure truly begins. This is the day where after that day, everything is different. In the final book of the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis has this explanation for a heaven-like experience. And um, it's just so good, as much as I don't want to pull out like why a fantasy to give you theology, this is that good, okay? He says, the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. And now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read and which goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. We get connected to God's story with the hopes that we will live the great story. And what I see in, in Revelation, what I see there is not the eternal church service. What I see is we become our truest selves. Everything that is beautiful about you that God made, your creativity, your gifts, your passions, your desires, like I think that's still present in new creation. It gets turned up to 11 or maybe 11,000 stadia. There you go. But like it's, it's there. And so maybe you're looking at this and you're like, this is beautiful. This is so cool. So then here's the question, when will this happen? And Jesus has a very clear answer to that. Verse 7 of 22, look, I am coming soon. That was 2,000 years ago. I don't know that I call 2,000 years soon, but God does say that 1,000 years is like a day. Once again, in one of the books of C.S. Lewis, they're having a conversation with the God character, and they say, when will I see you again? He looks him in the eye, he says, soon. And they ask the really important follow-up question, when is soon? <laughs> and he says, I call all times soon. And I've worked on projects before, and once again, I've said I have a three-year-old, and she has an attention span that is different than mine. Not that much different, but it's different, okay? <laughs> but she's like, Dad, are you done yet? Nope, I'm still working on this. Dad, are you done yet? Nope, still working on this. And I wonder if we can go about our lives and maybe ask that question, Dad, are you done yet? and be really, really joyfully satisfied when we get the answer, nope, not yet. He's doing something. So what does this teach us about God? What does it teach us about ourselves? How are we supposed to live? Last week, I talked about how we live in Babylon. We live in the kingdom that is not God's kingdom. We find our feet on Babylonian real estate, but that we don't let 
the kingdoms of this world live in our heart. And when we follow Jesus, there's this thing that happens in our hearts where we become an embassy or a beachhead. We become this little piece of new creation. So new creation starts with us. It starts in our hearts and we start to live in light of that story because we are in an engagement period awaiting the wedding. And how do we conduct ourselves? Like someone who's called out. That's actually the Greek word for a group of people called out of one group of people called out to another group of people is called a church. A group that is called out to be different. There's, there's a book by um, a scholar named Scott McKnight where he calls the church a community called Tove. And this is why this matters is because the word that God uses in Hebrew when he creates the world and he looks at things, he says, well, that's good. He makes this, it's good. He makes that, it's good. The Hebrew word for good is tov. We're a community where we're trying to live out this new creation idea. And in the new creation, there is no addiction. There is no enslavement to greed or lust or substances. And so in the church, like in our hearts, we pursue a lifestyle where there is no addiction. There is no enslavement to greed or lust or pride. We start to live out this reality. And the tough thing about churches is that we are full of former Babylonians. Like we're full of recovering, like former citizens of not the kingdom of God. And so we've got this ideal and we're like, we want to be people that live out this new creation, new kingdom ethic. Andrew, I believe you. You're preaching so good on Sunday. I'm going to start Monday morning and I'm going to lean into the kingdom of God. And then you know what's going to happen like two minutes later? Something bad. I don't know. I'm not trying to jinx you or anything. It's just, this is just how life goes. You're like, I'm trying to do the right thing, but there's people in the way. And we say, this is the ethic. This is who we want to be. And then as a church, we show up and we're here at best. And maybe God's okay with that. Maybe that's part of the process of being his people. But in the meantime, we await joyfully. We prepare. We chase after this reality. At the end of Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come. They invite the person who is thirsty, the person who is hungry, the person who is dissatisfied to come find something better. And so if you look around at the world, and maybe you are at a place where you're dissatisfied, you're hurting, you're hungry, maybe it's not bad, it's just meh. Like I could use some more. You ready for one more C.S. Lewis? Because he's that good, okay? In a prologue to one of his books, he says that if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. So if you're hungry for more, maybe it's because you were made for more. Let's be the church. Father God, we love you. We ask you to show up in us. We ask you to show up for us. We wait for a good day, a day when you put things right. Jesus, we hang on to you and we trust you. In the meantime, let us be your people. And will you please be our God? Amen. I'm going to sing an old hymn. If you know it, please sing along with me. But this is also our time, kind of the big point in our gatherings, where we come forward and we take some little bit of unleavened bread and a little bit of juice it's pretty simple, but it reminds us of Jesus' body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed for us. And every time we do that, we proclaim the truth all over again. Until he comes again soon, 
We do this when we gather. So I encourage you as I sing, uh, grab the elements and take communion, his body and his blood that was shed for us. Meditate, pray. (coughs) To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world. That he gave us his son Who yielded his life An atonement for sin And opened the life gate That all may go in So praise the Lord Praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Oh, perfect redemption. The purchase of blood to every believer. The promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus. A pardon receives. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done great things he has taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when jesus we see so praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory great things he has done so praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory great things he has done and give him the glory great things he has done In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise for it. 
despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. And all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. And praise the Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a couple things before we head out. If you remember last year, we did a building fund campaign and we raised uh, money to get new flooring. Uh, so that is actually going to start happening. Uh, so we are looking for some volunteers on April 6th, this Saturday from 9 to 2. Uh, we're going to be ripping out all this carpet and we know how much you love it. So Andrew's going to have some frames. And if you want to get a piece of it and cut it out and put it in a frame, see Andrew. And <laughs> uh, no, we're going to have a dumpster and everything. We're going to just throw it away. Uh, so if you can't help, there's a sign, out sh uh, sign up sheet out in the lobby there. Uh, also, if you weren't aware, Easter is next Sunday. Uh, so there's some cards if you want to invite some friends and family. And then we're also doing a Thursday night service uh, between 7 and 7.30. That's going to be contemplative. We're going to take communion together, uh, focus on Jesus and the cross and those final hours. And then uh, if you come early, we're going to have the doors open at 6.30. There's going to be stations of the cross that you can come through and kind of prepare your heart for that. So it's going to be a big week. Uh, let's go out. Let's be the church. And God bless.